In the summer of 67, on the 28th of February, John Miles Sharp was born in a hospital based in Mornington, Victoria. By all accounts, John Sharp had a normal, mundane childhood. Nothing amiss and nothing extraordinary. He was shy and somewhat struggled with schooling, like many other kids across the nation. The year John turned 27, 1994, he was working at the Commonwealth Bank. Anna Marie Kemp was a 31-year-old woman from New Zealand who, like many others, had come to Australia to start something new and exciting. Anna was also working at the Commonwealth Bank, which is where she and John first met. Their love affair took off quick and strong, and in October of 1994, they married. Both Anna and John were happy, in love, and looking forward to their future together. Over the next several years, John and Anna lived together in numerous properties around the Mornington Peninsula area in Victoria. She was always in contact with her parents back in New Zealand, speaking to her mum multiple times a week. Anna had everything she could dream of. The only thing left was to become a mother herself. This would happen in 2002. Little Gracie Louise Sharp was born in August. She was beautiful and born so little. However, she was unfortunately born with a congenital abnormality called hip dysplasia. This abnormality would require Gracie to undergo orthopaedic treatment by using a corrective harness for the first three months of her life. For little Gracie, this was an uncomfortable and undesirable outcome. She would cry often and wouldn't settle and would find sleeping and eating difficult. Anna tried everything she could to ease her little girl's disdain, but unfortunately, nothing worked. Even after Gracie came out of the harness once the three months had passed, she was still unsettled, finding it difficult to eat, and could not get into a proper sleeping routine. This led Anna to attend Hillview Maternity Unit of Peninsula Health in November of 2002, seeking help for severe anxiety and unable to cope with the strains and stress of the constant demanding role of trying to help Gracie. Unfortunately, due to Gracie's need for constant attention and Anna's own mental health issues, this began to impact somewhat significantly on John and Anna's marriage. Over the next few months, Anna would end up having three inpatient admissions for respite with Gracie to try and help implement a proper and continuous sleeping and eating pattern, as well as to help with her own anxiety issues which had not subsided. Sometime in 2003, John would go to a local shop in Mornington, Sport Philip Marine. This store sold items from scuba diving gear to fishing gear. John entered the store with one item on his mind to purchase. After browsing for a little, John walked up and placed a spear gun and an extra spear onto the counter and paid cash, leaving no trace of the purchase. Before this, John had never expressed any interest in the activity of spear fishing. After the purchase, John would practice shooting the gun in his backyard, firing repeatedly learning how to operate the spear gun. As weeks of practice passed by, John began to have the basic skills required to begin spearfishing in the open water. Moving into the second half of 2003, Anna and John decided to try and purchase their first home together, something new and exciting to distract from the whirlwind of their lives since little Gracie was born. Even though Anna would never blame her daughter, nor speak an ill word of her, it had been a tough year, and everyone needed and deserved a change in season. September 2003 marked the month that their goal came true, and their searching for a home ended when they received news they'd successfully purchased a house. The address was 116 Prince Street, Mornington, Victoria. Things finally started to settle for Anna and John. Even though Gracie was still experiencing some minor setbacks, the situation was much smoother than it had been in previous months. Anna was happy. She had her loving husband, her beautiful daughter, and now her own home. She was surrounded by friends who cherished her, and even though majority of her family were back in New Zealand, mainly Dunedin, she still felt close to them, as they'd all make contact frequently. November of 2003 seemed like any other November. The Sharp family were getting ready for the festive season that was just around the corner. Anna was spending her time with her much-loved daughter and having coffee dates with her friends. However, sometime in the month of November, Anna got news she wasn't expecting. She was pregnant. 
This news was an unexpected shock for Anna. She was thrilled and excited. As one of her closest friends stated, Anna never wanted Gracie to be an only child. She didn't want Gracie to be alone when the time would come that her and John wouldn't be around anymore. She wanted Gracie to have comfort in knowing that she had someone else here with her. Anna was very excited. She'd always said that she didn't want one child. She never wanted Gracie to be on her own. So that once, as life goes on, once mum and dad are no longer there, at least Gracie would have somebody. Anna was sure John would share her enthusiasm. When Anna told John, he was expectedly shocked. He was stunned and taken aback. Unfortunately, his shock and disbelief didn't turn into joy as it did for Anna. He became angry and frustrated, telling Anna they should only have one child and that Anna had promised him they would only ever have one child. John demanded that Anna be rid of the baby, that they couldn't handle another child, another baby. It was hard enough after what Gracie went through. He told Anna that the stress of having another child would be too much and that Gracie was more than enough. Anna was understandably upset over this and confided in her friends and parents. They were shocked, as this was a side of John they hadn't heard of nor seen. For him to yell and argue in front of Gracie about the unborn child Anna was carrying was completely out of character from what they knew. Anna told them she was going to keep the baby, but she knew John wouldn't be happy and that this perhaps might cause some serious issues to their marriage. Times that I would visit, I was starting to see a change in his demeanour. Um, yeah, I don't think the, the announcement of her having a, a second child was something that John actually was happy about. Just he, he was almost like he was hostile towards her, which just struck me as odd because he'd always seemed a quite gentle, shy, retired person, and for him to you know, yell back at her in front of Gracie, I just thought that was rather strange. And I, I could, you could feel the tension in the air between the two of them, and it was obviously at odds. Unfortunately for Anna, her prediction of how it would affect John and her family was right. However, Anna, nor anyone else, could foresee what was about to happen. John became angry, frustrated and spiteful. He couldn't understand Anna's actions and choices, and why she wouldn't listen to him when he said not to keep the baby. As the days trickled by, John began to resent Anna and the unborn child with such ferocity it grew into a monster. A monster that would become known nationwide as the Mornington Monster. On the 19th of March 2004, a female friend of Anna's stayed the night at the Sharp residence. They all laughed and enjoyed each other's company. Nothing untoward was experienced by the friend. She later noted that everything was perfectly normal, as it always had been, and that Anna had appeared happy. March 21st, the Sharp family attended the Muradoc steam train for a birthday party of a nephew. The day went without a hitch. The party was a fun event where everyone laughed and had a great time. Other attendees didn't notice anything amiss. John was being the usual husband, whilst little Gracie had fun with family. Everything seemed fine, normal. The following morning, March 22nd, Anna did the usual by taking Gracie to daycare. She then phoned her mother and they spoke like normal, laughing and sharing their day's events. During the phone call, nothing was unusual. Later that day, Anna made plans with a friend to meet up for a coffee that Friday, the 26th of March. Later that night, Anna again spoke to another friend on the phone, talking for a long amount of time. That phone call, like all previous one in the past days, went normal and caused no concern. On March 23rd, Anna made a phone call to her private health insurance and asked if her unborn child could be added to her health cover policy. By late evening on the same day, John and Anna had begun arguing. It's not entirely certain what the fight was about, but there are assumptions it was about the unborn child again, and John's vehement demands that he did not want another baby. In between 9pm and 10pm, both John and Anna went to bed. Anna fell asleep quickly. John did not. He lay there, still stewing from their argument. The reality of Anna not getting an abortion was coming down hard. She wasn't budging. She wanted this baby, and she was doing it no matter what. 
John couldn't stand it. He hated her. He hated her and the baby. As he lay there, thinking of all the horrible things Anna was forcing him to do, he began thinking of killing her. The thoughts had perhaps entered his mind previously, but they had been nothing but mere thoughts. However, tonight they had something different behind them. They vibrated with hate, shouting in his head. John sat up, got out of bed and went out into the garage. He grabbed the spear gun, an extra spear. As he stood beside the sleeping Anna, he stared down at her. Pure hate coursed through his veins as he lifted the spear gun, aimed and shot Anna in the temple from just a few centimetres away. He dropped his arms to his side and watched Anna for a few seconds. She was still breathing, but barely. John couldn't believe his luck. To him, she made his life hell, and now she was making her own death difficult. He grabbed the extra spear, loaded it, and emotionless lifted the gun again. A quick pull of the trigger and a second spear entered innocent and defenceless Anna's head. She stopped breathing. John had killed his wife, an unborn baby. He left the bedroom, grabbed some towels, and used them to cover Anna's lifeless body. Even though John had just coldly taken the life of his wife, he couldn't bear to look at the crime he had just committed. Afterwards, nonchalantly, he went downstairs and fell asleep on the pull-out sofa bed. Meanwhile, little Gracie slept through the evil that had just taken place. She had just lost her mother, and the innocent child would never know that it was her own father that had done the cruel act. The next day, a TV serviceman had knocked on the front door, surprising John. Anna's body was still in their bed, and to avoid the grisly crime being discovered, John came up with an elaborate lie to avoid the serviceman coming in. John then took Gracie to daycare. Upon arriving back home, John attempted to remove the spear from Anna's lifeless body. However, he was unsuccessful. This left him with only one choice, to unscrew the shafts from the spearhead, leaving them embedded in her head. After doing this, John went to his backyard and dug a shallow grave. He laid Anna inside and buried her. John cleaned up and left to pick up his daughter. The following day, March 25th, John contacted two of Anna's friends, stating that Anna had left him for another man. This confused her friends for several reasons. The first was that John himself had contacted them. This had never happened before. It was always Anna who called them, no matter the reason. Moreover, the fact that John was claiming Anna had left him for another man was surreal. She had made no mention whatsoever of seeing or even being slightly interested in another man. Being these friends were her best of friends, they assured themselves that surely she would have told them something about this. To make matters even more confusing, John claimed that the unborn child was not his, but this mystery man's child, and that Anna would be coming to collect Gracie on the coming Sunday. This particular part struck both friends as extremely unlikely and odd. Anna's world was her daughter, and they knew she would never leave her, especially not to run off with her supposed secret lover. We're going to meet on the Friday morning, and everything was going fine, and out of the blue on the Thursday, I get a phone call, and it's John. I've never spoken to him on the phone before. I don't understand why he's calling, but I, you know, listened to what he had to say, and he said to me, Anna's left. And I said, okay. I just thought it was odd that it was John meeting for starters at work. And I asked, you know, where Anna was and he said that she'd left with another man and that she'd left Gracie behind, which immediately alarm bells rang. I had the hairs on the back of my neck um, stood up because I knew that Anna would never leave Gracie behind. There was no way Anna would have left her child behind. Later, John would call Anna's mother, who had left numerous voice messages on the phone's answering machine. He told the same lies. Immediately, Anna's mother knew something was wrong. She knew her daughter, and she knew that what John had just told her could not be true. Not only had John told the people closest to her that Anna had run away, 
He further told Gracie's daycare the same thing, stating that Gracie would no longer be attending the facility as Anna was taking Gracie on Sunday. Sometime between Anna's death and the 27th of March, John took little Gracie with him to the store he had originally bought the spear gun from. Whilst there, he purchased another spear. Later that night, John put Gracie to bed in her cot. He then had numerous glasses of whiskey, trying to numb himself for the horrific actions he was about to commit. In between 9 or 10 p.m., John went to the garage, like before, and retrieved the spear gun and the newly purchased spear. He crept into Gracie's room and looked down at his little daughter sleeping, her small body lying atop of the cot mattress. Slowly, he lifted his arms and aimed at her head. It is speculated that he couldn't watch himself doing this pure evil act and closed his eyes before pulling the trigger. The spear shot forward and impacted little Gracie's head on the left side, impaling her. However, unfortunately, Gracie did not die. She woke immediately and began screaming in pain, the spear still embedded within her skull. John panicked and ran downstairs, grabbing the two spear shafts that he had unscrewed from Anna's head. Running back up to Gracie's room where she was still screaming and crying, John loaded and fired the two steel rods into Gracie's head. These further malicious acts still did not kill Gracie, so John grabbed a hold of the first spear, pulled it out of Gracie, and refired it again. This final shot finally put Gracie out of the painful and horrifying experience she had just endured. John Miles Sharp had just brutally murdered his less than two-year-old defenceless daughter. The next morning, John held a towel in front of his face as he pulled the spears from Gracie's head. Even though just the night before he had brutally murdered her, he could not bear to look at her innocent little body that was still and motionless. He then proceeded to wrap little Gracie in garbage bags, followed by a tarpaulin, before bounding her with black duct tape. A small and innocent child, treated like nothing but trash. To further this, John took the small bundle and disposed of his daughter at the Mornington Refuse Transfer Station, stating to the attendant that he had a bootload of hard waste. Whilst there, he also discarded the spear gun, the spears, as well as some of Gracie's clothes and toys. Later that day, John phoned Anna's mother again. During the short conversation, John told her that Gracie was now with Anna in a bigger and better place. This only added to the worry and confusion for Anna's family back in New Zealand. On March 29th, John went to the local Bunnings Warehouse store in Frankston. There, he purchased a number of items including a roll of duct tape, two tarpaulins and an 1800 watt home light electric chainsaw. After returning home, John fabricated a false email address and wrote an email to Anna's brother, claiming that she and Gracie were safe, happy, and wanted to be left alone to try and start a new life with this mystery man who had swept her off her feet. John used the email as a ploy to create a scenario that Anna was truly safe and well, as well as Gracie, and hoped the email would be enough that her family would not contact her again. However, Once Anna's brother received the email, it did the exact opposite. After showing his mother the email, she immediately had dire concerns and went straight to the Dunedin police and began reporting her daughter as missing. John would later receive a phone call from a police officer from New Zealand, asking about the whereabouts of his wife, unborn child and daughter. John would explain the same fabricated story, that Anna had left him and taken Gracie to begin a new life with another man. John also claimed that Anna was now living around the Chelsea area. A day or so after the 29th of March, John would exhume his wife from his backyard. He then proceeded to use the chainsaw to dismember her body into three pieces. Once the gruesome feat was complete, John then wrapped each piece of Anna in the tarpaulin and then bound those pieces with the duct tape. Again, John would dispose of his late wife at the Mornington transfer station, as well as the chainsaw, and other items used in the appalling act. Both Anna and Gracie had been carelessly disposed of at the Mornington Transfer Station. Both had been transferred in the course of the transfer station's operations to a landfill site located elsewhere in the Morning Peninsula. 
John, over the next coming week, slowly began disposing of any other items that could point at him being the killer. This included bloodstained mattresses, bedding, pillows, clothing, and more. John also wrote more emails to Anna's friends and his own family, feigning to be from Anna. However, no email did what it was intended to do. Every person who received the email only became increasingly more worried for the welfare of their beloved friend. John was making and falling into his own trap. To further this, John arranged for flowers to be sent to Anna's mother for Mother's Day and her birthday, with a loving note attached to them from Anna. However, none of this worked on Anna's family. Thus, on May 20th, Anna's mother again urged New Zealand police to look further into her daughter's sudden and strange disappearance. New Zealand police agreed and contacted the Victorian Police Department and requested that an investigation be conducted on the apparent disappearance of Anna Kemp and her daughter, Gracie Louise. The same morning that the New Zealand police reached out to Victorian police, the Victorian police dispatched a group of police officers to the address of John Sharp. They knocked on the door and John answered. He was confused and asked if there was anything wrong. The police told him that Anna's family were increasingly worried about Anna and their granddaughter and the supposed actions of Anna the last few weeks to months. John confidently tried telling police the same story he had spewed too many times before. John claimed Anna and Gracie were living in the Chelsea area, but he wasn't sure where exactly. Furthermore, John stated that Anna had in fact come back to the house multiple times to grab numerous items, such as clothing and other personal belongings. The police, weary, required John to sign a written statement that he denied any involvement into Anna's disappearance or that of Gracie's. In the statement, John had stated that he and his wife had experienced marital disharmony and that this had been going on for some time before Anna finally left him. When Anna finally did leave him, she told John that there was another man, and she was now pregnant with his child. John stated this conversation had happened after going to their nephew's birthday party at the steam train outing. After this, Anna left and would later collect Gracie on a Sunday. John had then written that he only saw the both of them three times after this date. After the police took his statement, John felt as if though everything was going perfectly. The police seemed to believe him, and he had discarded any and all evidence leading back to him. However, due to police activity, Anna and Gracie Kemp were now regarded as missing and became local news. In late May, John agreed to multiple interviews to try and reach Anna and persuade her to come home. On June 10th, John was required to attend a formal interview that was recorded at the Mornington Police Station. The interview was long, running for hours. However, John maintained that Anna had simply left him. Police still did not believe John, nor his strange and unlikely story. Furthermore, the police had been keeping a surveillance team on John for a few weeks. By doing this, they had seen John going through bushes near a toilet block and retrieving a credit card from a plastic bag that had been stashed. Moreover, John was also seen discarding possible incriminating evidence in a garbage bin at Mount Martha, a bayside beach that was not far away. On June 22nd, police formally arrested John and interviewed him again. However, this time, police had taken John to the homicide squad at St Kilda Road. The first of interviews that day, John upheld the same story, continuing to deny all involvement of any harm towards Anna and Gracie. However, before the second interview, the police allowed John to spend a short amount of time with his family in the interview room. Once the second interview began, John finally admitted everything. John told the detectives that the marriage with Anna was anything but happy. He described how Anna was controlling and moody. According to John, Anna even came between him and his family, preventing John from seeing them as often as he'd liked. John protested that Anna was cruel and mean, belittling him and making him feel worthless, both as a husband and a father. Because of this, John had snapped on the night of her murder. He couldn't stand it any longer and decided to end it. Unfortunately, John also thought that Gracie should be with her mother, as the children always go with their mother. 
This train of thought is what convinced him to brutally murder Gracie as well. There were suspicions and accusations from family and others that John had been sexually abusing Gracie and that Anna had found out and was going to report it. Out of fear and anger, this is what led John to kill Anna and subsequently Gracie as well. However, this has never been proven and therefore cannot be listed as a definite theory. Many facial recognition and lying experts viewed the interview footage after it was announced that he had been the one to murder his family. Crocodile tears was a common term to describe what John had done whilst on national TV. I'm speaking today to make a national appeal. People like former bank clerk John Sharp. In 2004, he murders his pregnant wife, Anna, in the most horrific way, by claiming she's left him for another man. Anyone who knows the whereabouts of Anna, please contact the police. But that's not the worst of it. As he plays the distraught husband, Sharp is hiding the fact he's also killed his baby daughter, Gracie, with that same spear gun. My biggest fear is being denied part of Gracie's future. What I'm not seeing is the emotion in the right place. Steve Van Apperen is a behavioural analyst, an expert in detecting deception, studying what people say, how they say it and how they act. Sadness and grief is the most difficult uh, human emotion to replicate on our face uh, because a number of muscles take uh, combine and uh, we don't see that. Did you kill your wife, Anna? I haven't harmed my wife or my daughter. I haven't harmed either of them. Our marriage may be over, but I still love you as you are the mother of our beautiful daughter, Gracie, whom we both adore more than anyone else. If I could just come forward and even if you don't ring me, just the media or police. 37-year-old John Sharp just wants to hear from his estranged wife, Anna Kemp. On May 26th, just over two months since Anna and Gracie's disappearance, John Sharp makes his televised appeal for his wife and daughter's return. But the man he sees on television is quite different. Um, I thought he was acting, quite obviously acting. Whilst John remained in prison on remand, police combed the landfill site in Mornington for three weeks. During this time, the weather was unruly, raining and cold, making the search for the remains of Anna and Gracie an even more difficult task for the police. It's important to investigators that information be carefully controlled. Media can work for you and it can work against you. Um, and also that uh, the media weren't um, stepping in areas that could potentially compromise uh, investigations. The search for the remains of Anna and Gracie begins in late June. It was wet, very cold, wet. Uh, it was raining all the time and windy and the, had gum boots and protective gear on. Despite the appalling conditions, there is no shortage of police volunteers. The man in charge of the investigation, Homicide Squad Chief Steve Francis, is approached by several officers who are prepared to put in extra time to find the bodies. Finally, after an exhaustive search, both Anna and Gracie's remains were found and positively identified. Search continues. Police Chaplain Jim Pilmer is a welcome presence for officers working under the most trying conditions. I have found that uh, just being there, which sounds negative and passive, uh, is actually very valuable. And uh, uh, I had uh, some phone calls and, uh, and a letter uh, saying just that, you know, thanks for being there, when in fact I didn't think I did much. Uh, one, one feels that uh, there's, there's value in it, uh, even though at the time you don't think so. After days of intensive searching through thousands of tons of waste, there's a breakthrough. A tarpaulin is uncovered, containing some of Anna's remains. By mid-July, all of her remains have been unearthed. Then, searchers find Gracie's body. Shane and I carried Gracie out and carried her out up <coughs> through the landfill side up to the, to the main gates and we waited for the undertaker. And, um, and again, I was pleased for Lily and, and her family, her, her sons. 
place for everyone, really, that we'd, that we'd found it. After all evidence was pertained from the remains, the bodies of the two innocent lives were released. Anna and Gracie were finally laid to rest in Green Park, Dunedin, New Zealand. Both Anna and Gracie were buried under the Kemp name, not Sharp. Anna's memorial also mentioned her unborn son, who she had wanted to name Francis. John appeared before the Supreme Court of Victoria in February of 2005, where he was arraigned and pleaded guilty to both murders. On the 5th of August 2005, John would be sentenced to serve two consecutive life terms of imprisonment with a non-parole period of 33 years. Unfortunately, Sharp could not be convicted for also taking the life of the unborn baby due to laws that were in place at the time. As he was handed the sentence, John bowed his head and wiped tears from his face, breathing heavily. The judge had said of John killing his daughter was simply so that your first crime would not be discovered. He also stated that Sharp's killings were egregiously wicked. Anna's family watched the trial via video link in their home in New Zealand. When the ruling came down and he was finally sentenced, Anna's mother broke down. John's own parents described his crimes as horrific. Valerie Sharp, John's mother, read a prepared statement outside the court. She stated that John's crimes were horrific and he will serve the sentence given. Other members of John's family have shown support and love for Anna's grieving family, giving apologies for the horror they have experienced. How bad was he? I think he's evil. To be clinically sane, to shoot your wife, to just cover her face and go to sleep on a the couch, then to bury her, then later on dig her up, cut her up, and dump her in the trash. No sane person could do that. Even an insane person couldn't do that. He was cold and calculating. He's evil. He really is an evil person. John Sharp spear gunned his wife and baby daughter to death. He wasn't just bad, he was plain evil. But was he mad? How do you explain a killer like that? Was he insane? He definitely wasn't insane. And that's something that's hard for people to wrap their minds around how someone could do something like that. But the psych assessments that were done before his sentencing showed there was no evidence of psychosis or delusions. And you can see that with the way that he premeditatedly buys the spear gun, he practices using it. And then the calculated way he goes about trying to cover up the crime. There's no thought disorder, or there's no insanity at all. He knew what he was doing. Since John's time in prison, he resides in protective custody due to the monumental amount of threats against his life from fellow inmates. John Sharp is eligible for parole in 2037. He will be 71. I haven't harmed my wife or my daughter. I haven't harmed either of them. Mm.